to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Dan Friedel. And I'm Katie Weaver. This program is aimed at English learners. So we speak slowly, and we use words and phrases, especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, we have reports about the Alaska pox virus, an effort to move 21 rhinos in Kenya, tips for international students who plan to take the SAT or ACT, and a discussion about words and phrases created by American presidents. Mario Ritter Jr. is up first with this story. Health officials in the American state of Alaska have known for nine years about a virus causing rare, mild illness. But a recent case that resulted in a man's death has brought new attention to what is being called the Alaska pox virus. Here's some background on the virus. Alaska pox belongs to the family of orthopox viruses that can infect animals and humans. These viruses usually cause lesions or pox on the skin. Some are more dangerous than others. Smallpox is the best known member of the orthopox virus family. Others include camelpox, cowpox, horsepox, and mpox, formerly known as monkeypox. Alaska pox was discovered in 2015 in a woman who lived near Fairbanks, Alaska. It mainly has been found in small mammals, but house animals, such as dogs and cats, can carry the virus, health officials say. Seven people in Alaska have become infected with it in the last nine years. People with Alaska pox have developed one or more bumps on the skin. They also experience joint or muscle pain and swollen parts of the body called lymph nodes. Officials believe Alaska pox spreads through contact with infected animals. Alaska health officials say there have been seven people infected with Alaska pox since the virus was discovered. But the latest case represents the first time someone is known to have died from it. The older man lived on the Kenai Peninsula. He was being treated for cancer and had a suppressed immune system because of the drugs. Health officials believe that Alaska pox is rare. That said, wildlife can carry infection risks and should not be kept at home. The best way to keep pets and family members safe is to keep a safe distance and wash your hands after being outdoors. I'm Mario Ritter, Jr. Conservationists in Kenya are celebrating the return of many rhinoceroses to an area where they have not been for many years. The successful move of 21 eastern black rhinos to a new home will give them space to reproduce and could help increase the population of the highly endangered animals. The effort was Kenya's biggest ever move of rhinos. The rhinos were taken from three parts that are becoming overpopulated 
to the private Loisaba Conservancy, a place where poachers killed all the rhinos many years ago. Moving the rhinos required 18 days. Conservationists followed the rhinos using a helicopter. They then shot them with special guns that inject tranquilizer into the animals, which weigh hundreds of kilograms. The rhinos then have to be loaded into the back of a truck. Disaster nearly struck early in the move. A tranquilized rhino fell into a small river. Officials involved with the move held the rhino's head above water with a rope to prevent it from drowning, while a drug to undo the tranquilizer took effect. The animal was then released. Some of the rhinos were taken from Nairobi National Park. They had to travel 300 kilometers. Loisaba Conservancy said it has put aside around 25,000 hectares for the new arrivals, which are a mix of males and females. Kenya has had some success in bringing back black rhinos. The population fell from around 20,000 in the 1970s to below 300 in the 1980s because of poaching, conservationists say. The loss increased fears that the animals might disappear from the country. Kenya now has around 1,000 black rhinos, the third biggest population after South Africa and Namibia. There are just over 6,400 wild black rhinos left in the world. All of them are in Africa, the organization Save the Rhino International said. Tom Sylvester is the chief executive officer of Loisaba Conservancy. He said Kenya's plan is to get its black rhino numbers to 2,000 over the next 10 years. Once we have 2,000 individuals, we will have established a population that will give us hope that we have brought them back from extinction, he said. Kenyan officials say they have moved more than 150 rhinos in the last 10 years. But not all moves have succeeded. One attempt to move 11 rhinos in 2018 ended with all of the animals dying. An investigation found 10 of the rhinos died from stress, a lack of water and food. Since then, new guidelines have been created for the capture and moving of rhinos in Kenya. I'm Gregory Stockel. they will require standardized tests such as the SAT and ACT from applicants again. Some of them went test optional during the pandemic. The schools include Dartmouth College, Georgetown University, and the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Dartmouth College in New Hampshire said students from other countries will need to submit results from those tests or an equivalent standardized national exam. Alan Coe is the founder of Cardinal Education, a company that helps students with college preparation, including applications. He said Dartmouth's announcement only made official what had been de facto true. He noted that between 80 and 90 percent of students admitted to top universities sent test scores, even when they were not required. Coe said students who attend international schools 
that use the A-level tests from Great Britain may not need to take the SAT or ACT since those tests are so well known. The tests from India may be useful too. However, students coming from other countries should take the ACT or SAT. Andrew Taylor is a vice president at the nonprofit organization that runs the ACT. He said the tests are important for international students because they permit American schools to compare students, even if they come from different educational systems. In an email message to VOA, a representative from the College Board, which runs the SAT, said the test plays an important role in helping international students be seen by colleges and universities. Test scores can confirm a student's grades or even demonstrate their strengths beyond what their high school grades may show. So if you are an international student planning to apply to college in the U.S., what should you know about the tests? The SAT has two parts, reading and math. Students can earn a top score of 800 for each part, making 1,600 a perfect score. The SAT is an adaptive test, which means the questions will change based on a student's answer to the previous question. As a result, the SAT takes less time for most students than the ACT. The ACT is the same for every student who takes the test on the same day. The ACT has four parts, math, science, English, and reading. The top ACT score is 36. Both tests are now available to be taken with a computer at international testing centers. For the most part, CO advises international students to take the ACT because it is much easier to get a perfect ACT score than a perfect SAT score. Based on how the final ACT score is calculated, Co said there are more ways to get to the perfect score of 36. For English learners, Co has this advice. So I'd say if your English is really strong all around, ACT could be great for foreigners. But I think for the average foreigner where English might be a little bit of a liability and math might be a little bit stronger, then the SAT may be a better test. Taylor of the ACT added that the ACT has a science section. So for students who may not be strong in science, the SAT could be a better choice. Both Co and Taylor say students should take practice tests from both the ACT and SAT to decide which may be better for them. You can find more information online, such as testing dates and locations of test centers at the SAT and ACT websites. Co and Taylor suggest that international students take the tests at least one year before finishing high school. If there is room for improvement, Co said, students can practice and take it again six months later. Taylor reminded students that most schools will consider a super score, which is the best score from each test category. So there is no doubt that students do better um, if they take more than one test. So if they're in a position to be able to take more than one test, we would always recommend that. And give yourself the time 
to do some additional learning between tests. So, you know, think about where you struggle, think about where you can be ready and, and go from there. Arkar Chen of Myanmar took the SAT in 2016, one year after he finished high school. He studied for the test, but was still surprised at how difficult the reading part was. I would say like 80% of the time, I have no idea what what it's asking. But the thing with SAT is that when you practice enough, you kind of see a pattern and you kind of know what answer the, uh, the test maker are looking for. In addition, Chen said students need to solve math problems quickly because each question has a limited time. There's no way you could do well without a lot of practice, he said. Chen said the concept of critical thinking was the biggest difference between American tests such as the SAT and the tests he saw growing up in Myanmar. The SAT, he said, tests a lot on your critical thinking skills. So I think that's why it can feel hard. Taylor of ACT says the test is part of the toolbox for colleges to decide about a student's ability to do well in school. More and more, Taylor said, higher ed is worried about graduation not just about admission. So we need to give not only the higher education institution as much data as we can about the student. We also need to give the student as much data as we can about themselves. Co observes that standardized tests favor a well-rounded student. So students who spend a lot of time studying math and engineering would be smart to spend time on reading and discussing books in English before taking the test. The parents of many international students are surprised to learn, as Ko said, Asian STEM-focused students are penalized the heaviest by American admissions officers for being very strong in math, but weak on reading. I'm Gina Bennett. And I'm Dan Friedel. And now, words and their stories from VOA Learning English. Monday of February is known as President's Day in the United States. So for today's words and their stories, we look at some of the famous and not so famous presidential words and their stories in history. From Teddy Roosevelt's lunatic fringe to Joe Biden's malarkey, the words and phrases said by U.S. presidents are often as unique as the American experience. We're really creating our own institutions through language, said Paul Dixon. He is the writer of Words from the White House, words and phrases coined or popularized by America's presidents. If you coin a word or phrase, you create it. Thomas Jefferson, America's third president, is said to have created more than a hundred words. One of those words is authentication, the act of proving or showing something to be true. Another word from Jefferson is Anglomania. It means to have extreme affection for all things English. The ending, mania, means to be crazy about something. Abraham Lincoln, the country's 16th president, is known for making powerful speeches during the Civil War. One of his best-known phrases 
a house divided against itself cannot stand, is drawn from the Bible. Historians note that Teddy Roosevelt, the 26th president, was the first president to use media to connect with the public. And he added several memorable words and phrases to American English. Dixon says Teddy Roosevelt creates this huge body of slang. The words include pack rat, loose cannon, lunatic fringe, and bully pulpit, among many others. A pack rat is someone who collects things that they do not need. A loose cannon describes a dangerous and uncontrollable person. Lunatic fringe describes people whose opinions are extreme and different from many others. And a bully pulpit is an important position, such as the presidency, that provides a chance to instruct, lead, or inspire others. In addition to slang, some presidents created slogans. A slogan is a short phrase used in advertising or political campaigns to get attention. America First came from Woodrow Wilson, the 28th president, in 1915, and not Donald Trump, the 45th. The 29th president, Warren Harding, gets credit for coming up with the term Founding Fathers. This describes the creators of the U.S. Constitution. Before Calvin Coolidge, the 30th president, no political campaigner had ever called himself a law and order candidate. This means they support police efforts and enforcement of laws. The 33rd president, Harry Truman, came up with the phrase, do nothing Congress. He is also famous for saying, if you can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen. Sometimes presidents changed names to better describe their purpose. Dixon says it was Franklin D. Roosevelt who changed the name of the report to Congress to the State of the Union. However, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the 32nd president, brought criticism when he said, well, it's pretty iffy as to where the Supreme Court stands on this. Iffy is another way of saying something is uncertain or unknown. His critics felt that the American president should use proper English. In 1961, Dwight Eisenhower, the 34th president, was praised for using the term military-industrial complex to warn against the powerful alliance of the military, government, and private corporations. But then he was criticized for using the word finalize in a speech. By adding I-Z-E, eyes, he turned the word final into a verb. Major papers at the time wrote that it was not proper English and called the word meaningless. Dixon says necessity is the reason presidents continue to create new words. There was a solid majority from Richard Nixon, the 37th president, and Barack Obama, the 44th president, used shovel-ready to describe public work projects that were ready to start immediately. When Joe Biden, the 46th president, ran for the White House in 2019, his campaign slogan was No Malarkey. Malarkey is believed to be an expression often used by Irish Americans to describe insincere 
or meaningless talk. And that, my friends, is no malarkey. I hope you enjoyed this special presidential words and their stories. Until next time, I'm Ana Mateo. I'm Dan Friedel, and you're listening to the Learning English Podcast. We just heard Ana Mateo tell us about the words and phrases used by American presidents. Ana, welcome to the program. Hi, Dan. Thanks for having me. Ana, can you tell our listeners why we are talking about presidents today? Sure. In the U.S., we are celebrating Presidents' Day on Monday. It is the third Monday in February. Ana, I suppose the presidents have a lot to say about the English language, especially American English. That is because almost everything they say is written down. That's right, Dan. As I mentioned, Thomas Jefferson, the third president, is thought to have created more than 100 words. And one historian said Teddy Roosevelt was known for putting informal words, known as slang, into the public record. Anna, I know he created one saying people use all the time. Pack rat. I'm trying to avoid being a pack rat. I like to hold on to things from a long time ago, even if I don't use them anymore. Dan, I think you should think twice about everything you decide to save. I know, I know. My wife says the same thing. But... I like being able to go back and look at old newspaper articles I wrote in the 1990s. Anna, I know you wanted to talk about how some presidents change words by adding endings to them. Can you explain that to our listeners and give some examples? Sure, Dan. President Dwight Eisenhower created some terms we still use today. But he received criticism at the time for turning the word final into a verb. He used the word finalize. Anna, are there any other presidents who did that kind of thing? Yes, there are, Dan. I mentioned that Thomas Jefferson is credited with creating about 100 new words. Well, he also liked adding the ending mania to something. For example, at the time of his presidency, the U.S. may have declared its independence from Great Britain, but some people still were centered on the way of life in England. So, what did he call that way of thinking? He added mania to the end of the word Anglo and created the term Anglomania. People have added mania to the end of words for a long time now. Hmm, Anna, I can think of some other words that have mania at the end, like egomania or pyromania or even wrestlemania. I did not know Jefferson was responsible. Well, it turns out he was. He was responsible for the Declaration of Independence and many, many words. Go, Thomas Jefferson! Anna... I think that realization about finalizes this conversation, don't you think? Yep, I think we have gotten all we can out of this bully pulpit. Thanks, Anna. You're welcome, Dan. Talk to you soon. And that's the Learning English Podcast for today. Thank you, Anna, for that report. And thanks to my VOA colleagues for their work on today's program. Most importantly, thank you for listening. For more, visit our website at learningenglish.voanews.com. I'm Katie Weaver. And I'm Dan Friedel.